Thank you. So um, I'm Fabio. I'm today's or this morning's session chair. Um, it's my, my honor to welcome Dr. Jeff Kloon as our speaker of this keynote. Um, Jeff has joined us virtually from Turkey, um, so we're glad to have him here, and hopefully there will be no bandwidth issues. Um, we will do the talk by a pre-recorded um, video. The topic of the talk is on AI generating algorithms, um, the fastest path to AGI with a focus on neural architecture search. And like yesterday, we will have a Q&A with Jeff after the talk, and uh, we'll take both um, in-person and virtual attendee questions, so you may want to start thinking about some questions. Um, Jeff Kloon is, is, an, is an associate professor of computer science at UBC in Vancouver and is also affiliated with the Vector Institute. And um, before these roles, Jeff was at OpenAI, Uber, and, associ and an associate professor at the University of Wyoming. Um, Jeff's area of expertise lies in robotics, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and evolutionary algorithms. In his re research, he made use of quality, diversity, and open-ended algorithms, and also used the concept of so-called AI-generating algorithms, which I'm personally most excited about. Um, his work was also published in, and featured in two nature journals. Um, and more recently, he, he has worked on video pre-training of foundation models for RL. Jeff has done a lot of work that is relevant to this AutoML conference, um, uh, folks like meta learning and neural architecture search. And so I'm very excited to hear um, him speak about these topics today. Without further ado, um, please welcome Jeff Kuhn. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from Istanbul, so I'm looking at old castles and uh, a lot of history, which is fantastic as we look toward the future in this conference. I really want to thank the organizers tremendously for giving me the, um, the honor of speaking with you today uh, and um, coming up with some creative solutions to the fact that I am remote. So we pre-recorded this talk because we wanted it to go without a hitch and not be interrupted, but obviously I'm here as well to say hello and answer questions at the end. Um, and as was just said, I've worked on a lot of different areas that are kind of thematic for this conference. So it was really hard for me to choose which things I wanted to focus on. But as you'll see, I chose um, focusing on uh, things related to neural architecture search and meta learning kind of within the AIGA paradigm. Um, so I'm excited to see what you think about all of that. Uh, and yeah, I'm recently, and I'm currently at UBC in the Vector Institute. I was recently at OpenAI. In fact, I wanted to mention really quickly that um, I'm so recently left OpenAI that I actually left the OpenAI affiliation by accident in the slide. So uh, that, that was a bit of a mistake. It should say Vector Institute and UBC. Uh, so without further ado to that slide, we'll play that now. And I look forward to hearing any questions you have. Uh, on, and I'm excited to share some of the work that we've been doing on architecture search. Everyone, this is Jeff Kloon. I am happy to be here today. First of all, I wanted to thank the organizers for the invitation to give a talk. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about meta learning synthetic data to accelerate neural architecture search. So, the first thing I want to do is give an overview. I want to talk about our most ambitious uh, goals as a field and how we might produce really powerful AI and this new paradigm I've been advocating called artificial intelligence generating algorithms or AIGAs. And then I'm going to talk about two kind of works that are situated within that paradigm or framework, specifically generative teaching networks and synthetic petri dish. Both of these are attempts to use meta learning to learn synthetic data that can catalyze neural architecture search. So let's take a step back, which is pretty rare for us to do as a field, and think about how might we produce the really grand ambitions of our field, which is to produce human level AI or AGI. And I think that we can all agree that we have a long way to go. And the question is, how will we get all the way to our goal? We rarely talk about that as a community. I think that if you kind of look to machine learning as a field, you'll see that there is actually kind of a dominant paradigm, which I call the manual path. And, you know, no one really talks about this, but the idea is that there's two, these two phases. First of all, we're going to manually identify all of the key building blocks to AI. And if you look at this list here, you'll see here are just some example building blocks that people either uh, introduce in a paper at a conference or improve in a paper at a conference. And that's what almost all of the papers at our conferences do, improve a building block or introduce one. And if you look at this list, you'll see it's kind of exhausting to think about uh, how many different building blocks we're trying to identify and discover. But it raises even harder questions, which is just how many more building blocks remain to be discovered? Are there hundreds more? Are there thousands more? And you know, can we find them all via this manual search one by one to, to identify these things? But even if we could, the manual path implies this phase two, which is never mentioned, which is that at some point we're supposed to put all of these building blocks together into some complex Rube Goldbergian thinking machine. And I just think we should be clear-eyed that that is a Herculean task. Uh, you know, it's been very difficult. Think about how many complex nonlinear interacting 
uh, things you're going to have to deal with when you start putting together hundreds or thousands of building blocks, each with their own hyperparameters. And if the whole thing isn't working, how do you debug that machine? You know, how do you know where to even start if nothing's working? And so that would be very, very difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. I also think sociologically, we're not set up for this. It would require something like a CERN project or an Apollo project or greater with thousands of machine learning scientists working together on this one collective goal for years and years and years. And that's just not how we're set up. So I think, uh, you know, it could work, but I think it is daunting. So I think if you look at machine learning, there is a clear trend um, that suggests an alternative path. And that is that hand-designed pipelines are ultimately outperformed and replaced by fully learned solutions. This happened with features in almost every modality, such as vision and hearing and NLP. It's increasingly happening to architectures, which is the theme of this workshop, as well as to hyperparameters, data augmentation, RL algorithms themselves, as we've seen in like learning to reinforcement learn, RL squared, Rubik's cube, et cetera. So the, this path suggests that we could have an alternative to the manual path, and that's what I call an AI generating algorithm, which is an algorithm that itself will try to kind of learn as much as possible of the total solution. It's almost like end-to-end -end AGI, if you will. <clears throat> and the idea is that you're going to bootstrap from simple initial conditions, like an algorithm that when it starts out doesn't have a lot of intelligence in it, slowly over time via an expensive outer loop, will be searching for better and better agents with better architectures, learning algorithms in the different environments, and ultimately it will produce an agent that itself is a very sample efficient learner, even if it got to that agent via very sample inefficient path. And we have an existence proof of that on Earth, where you know the very, very simple algorithm of Darwinian evolution, coupled with a planet-sized computer in a lot of time, produced human intelligence, which is the greatest intelligence we know of. So we know this can work. And ultimately, we got humans, which are very sample efficient and generalized well. So if we want to make progress, I think we need to push on three pillars simultaneously. The first is to meta-learn the architectures. The second is to meta-learn the learning algorithms themselves. And the third is to automatically generate effective training environments as we go. So this talk is going to focus on pillar one, but first I wanted to quickly mention that we've done some work in pillars two and three uh, in case you're interested. So I don't have time to get into this, but we've worked on differentiable Hebbian uh, neural networks, which are an alternative to SGD that are more biologically plausible. They're trained in the outer loop via SGD, so you can check that out. We've also done differentiable neuromodulated heavy in learning, which we also call uh, backprop mean, where you know parts of a network can turn learning on and off in other parts of the network. And we've shown some places where that's beneficial. <clears throat> we've also done a lot of work recently in using this style of AIGAs to go after one of the great challenges in machine learning, which is continually learning without catastrophic forgetting. So we have this paper, Learning to Continually Learn, where we just meta-learn the solution to continual learning in this algorithm, a neuromodulated meta-learning algorithm or animal. An animal is really powerful and produces state-of-the-art results just by having machine learning figure out how to solve the problem instead of humans trying to solve the problem. So I highly encourage you to check out that work. In terms of pillar three, we've done a lot of work lately with this POET algorithm in two separate papers. And the idea here is that we're automatically generating the problems while the agent is learning to solve them and kind of continuously producing a curriculum that pushes out its frontier of skills and knowledge. So all of these environments here were auto-generated while the agent learned to solve them. So let's get back to the main event, which is focusing on pillar one in this talk. Uh, I'm going to first talk about these two different projects, GTNs and Synthetic Petri Dish. So let's start with GTNs. First, I want to thank these wonderful co-authors. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight Felipe, who did a fantastic job leading this project. Uh, and this paper was published at ICML in 2020. So everyone in this workshop knows that architectures matter. Uh, they make a big difference, and so we should search for them. One common approach is that you, because you can't do a full evaluation every single time you want to evaluate an architecture, that's too expensive. So one approach is that you train for just a little period of time, and then you uh, use the performance that results after a little bit of training, or a moderate amount of training, as a proxy for the final performance of that network. Uh, and that estimate then can fuel your search. Now, the question we asked ourselves is, can we speed this up? So instead of having a moderate amount of training, we're going to try to get a very, very few number of SGD steps to stand in and serve as, a, in, as an informative proxy for the final performance of that architecture. And then we'll use that few-step accuracy as an estimate of asymptotic 
performance. So why might this work? How, why could you get away with just a very few number of samples? Well, one reason amongst many that you could think is that you know the data has some structure to it. As you see here, these are MNIST digits. Take a look at the zeros, for example. You might notice that there are three different styles of zeros. So maybe if you just sample like you know each of a couple examples that are prototypical of each of these three styles, and then you label those all as zeros, the network can quickly learn that all of those things should be called as zeros, and it doesn't need all the purple dots. And maybe it's better than a random sample of purple dots to get these like platonic um, representative examples. And there's, you know, here are a couple of papers that have done things like that. So you're sampling real data, the best small amount of real data to train fast. So the question is, if that works, can we do even better by using meta-learning to generate the data? So if you think about how humans learn, what you, one, one kind of insight is that we don't always learn something by doing that thing. So if you want to get really good at basketball, you don't just play full five-on-five -five basketball. Sometimes you dribble with two balls, even though that never exists in the game. Sometimes you watch other people play basketball, which you know is very different. Or you read a book on strategy on basketball, which certainly looks nothing like the data you get when you're playing basketball. And that can make you better. And also, over time, we get better training materials. So we get better drills and better videos and better books. So we can get better at generating synthetic data that can make us better at the real thing. We can get faster at learning the real thing. So can we meta-learn to generate data that enables rapid learning? That is the research question in this talk. Now, we weren't the first people to think about this. There's this wonderful paper uh, called Hypergradients, where what they did was they said, let's you know, differentiate through the entire learning process all the way back to the pixels to figure out how should the pixels be different to make learning better. So they started out with 10 images, one per class, and they feed them into a randomly initialized neural network. They train for a couple you know, epochs on that fake data. They look at the final performance of the trained network after it goes through SGD on that fake data on real validation loss data, and they then back propagate all the way back to the pixels to say, how do we make that validation loss better in terms of changing the pixels? And they optimize the pixels and therefore the data. And the result you can see here, here are the 10 images that were produced and they kind of look like digits zero through nine. And it's amazing, but if you train just on these images, you do okay on MNIST. This paper below then extended that to 100 samples. So we thought, all right, if that works, uh, it's still leaving a lot on the table. So what if we, instead of optimizing pixel by pixel, we learn a data generator? Because if you do pixel by pixel, you can't reuse any information. If you learn how to make a corner or a loop or a zero or figure out that edges matter or you know, con you know what colors matter, you can't then apply that to all the classes or different parts of the image. But you can if you have a generator. So that's what we have. The GTN is this generator here. And what's going to happen is we're going to give it noise. It's going to, as a function of that noise, generate a batch of different samples, uh, you know, different data. We're going to pass that entirely synthetic data into a learner neural net. Now, this learner neural net is a new architecture sampled from some large distribution. So the generator may have never have seen that architecture before. And then we're going to randomly initialize its weights. So it's a totally new neural net. It's going to train on this fake synthetic data that was produced by the generator. For a certain number of SGD steps, we'll take the final neural net, we'll apply it to real MNIST validation data, calculate the loss, that's our meta loss, and then we'll differentiate back through that entire process, through all of those steps of SGD, all the way back to the generator to say, how should the, pick the data have been different and better to improve the resulting meta loss? So these... Um, What's interesting about this is that this process therefore optimizes for few step accuracy, which means it really is trying to get that new architecture to do as well as possible on real MNIST after a very few number of steps on the synthetic data. So um, it's uh, really kind of optimized for speed. So uh, another thing I want to note is that we're also meta-learning the inner loop hyperparameters, both for GTN and for the controls, which you'll see in a bit. Cool. So we tried this on two different domains. First, I'm going to show you MNIST. And the first thing we ran into is that it doesn't work at all. <laughs> it's horribly unstable, and you can see uh, the result here. So Felipe is really good at this sort of thing, and so he went into the literature, and he discovered that there's this trick that was being used in a different context that he could use here, and it dramatically sped up, uh, sorry, dramatically stabilized learning. So we took the weight normalization trick from Salamence and Kingma, and you can see the equation here. This is just like a one-line uh, code change where you optimize V divided by its norm and then multiply it by G, learn G and V, 
and that produces your weight vector. And look at the difference in stability of learning. So on the left here, every single different run of the algorithm with different hyperparameters, while we were doing um, Bayesian optimization on hyperparameters, you know, totally massive variance. Some work really well, some work really poorly, it's all over the map. With weight normalization, look at the variance. The variance is almost nil, and it's just super consistent, and the performance is much better. So just kind of a strict win in performance and variance. And that led to the blue line here versus the red line. So side note for the talk, if you're doing any sort of meta-learning thing, I suggest you try this one line change of code uh, to improve your performance. Okay, so the, now that we can look at the real results, it's really interesting that you can do better training on synthetic data than training on real data. So these are, take the final produced generator, that's final data, sample a new architecture, and you either train it for, you know, 40 steps on real data or 40 steps on the synthetic data. And the synthetic data, which you see here in red, performs better, which is super exciting to see. So it is true that you can do better if you generate fake data than if you just randomly sample real data. Now, you might ask, what does the data look like? Well, we can show it to you. Here is the data that the network is trained on. And what, you know, one first thing you might say is, well, I can kind of see that these look like digits. That's pretty cool. And some of them are very recognizable. They look like ones and threes. But I'd also point out that many of them look totally alien, you know? So this here is supposed to be a six, and these are eights. And if I didn't tell you that, if I just showed you those images, I don't think you'd ever guess that those are supposed to be eights. So it's kind of philosophically fascinating that you can train on these alien weird digits and perform well on real digits. In fact, that reminds me of a discovery we made in 2015, which is that totally unrecognizable images can meaningfully affect neural nets and make them classify things with high confidence. And this led to this paper, Deep Neural Nets Are Easily Fooled. And so once again, we're kind of seeing this mysterious difference between how we see the world and how neural nets see the world. Uh, and, you know, I have many hypotheses, we do, for why GTN images are unrecognizable. So ask me in the Q&A if you're interested in me talking about them. So let's go back to uh, what we did. One thing that we thought of is that, you know, instead of just giving it a, a noise to produce samples, it'd be better if there could be a curriculum. You know, when you're trying to learn fast, it's helpful if you have a curriculum. And so what we do is instead of giving it random noise, Felipe l trained it to give it a learned tensor. So now it's got uh, a learn tensor, which is a function of inner loop steps. So it can choose kind of what data it wants to see early, middle, and late in the curriculum. And that gives it more degrees of freedom to optimize uh, the learning for this learner. And what we see is that the no curriculum case is red. That was what I was showing before. But the with a full curriculum, uh, actually, I'm not sure that, that was what I was showing before. But the point is, with no curriculum, it doesn't perform nearly as well as when you give it a full curriculum. Uh, there's more details in the paper here, but that is pretty cool to see that the curriculum helps. So everything I'm going to show going forward is going to be with a curriculum. So uh, I've already showed you that on inner loop training, which is on the left, that synthetic data, which is in red, beats real data that's in blue. I also wanted to show that the generator, which is in red, beats pixel by pixel optimization, which is in green here. So this is the, the 100 sample data set distillation 100 synthetic samples instead of a generator. So here's the benefit of uh, pushing it back into a generator as opposed to the direct encoding of pixel by pixel encodings. Now that was inner loop training. That's taking the final best networks, you know? But if you look across outer loop training, so this is when we're training the GTN, what you can see is first of all, the um, real data gets better over time. That's because we're optimizing its hyperparameters like learning rate, uh, et cetera. Um, and you can see that eventually the GTN kind of crosses over and still going up toward the end. So how do we combine this with neural architecture search? Uh, well, what we did here is we wanted to do that on CIFAR because that's a standard NAS benchmark instead of MNIST. So first I'll just tell you that all the same results qualitatively are the same on CIFAR as MNIST. So here's outer loop training on the left. And here is uh, inner loop training of the final network on the right. And once again, training on synthetic data is better than real data. In particular, if you pick a certain performance level, like the performance you get at the end of training on real data, the GTN can get there about four times faster in terms of that performance. The samples, if you compare them real samples on the left to fake samples, synthetic samples on the right, you see that, the, again, the synthetic samples don't look terribly real. They're pretty alien. But somehow training on that makes you recognize the things on the left. 
All right, so in terms of uh, using it for neural architecture search, the most important thing is that the prediction coming out of your uh, your proxy, you know, the, the GTN is standing as a, a proxy for the final true performance of any architecture, right? We want to have the performance after you train on GTN synthetic data for a very few number of steps, like 128 steps, to be indicative of what the performance of that architecture will be when it's actually trained on the real data for a really, really, really long time. And what you see is that there is a correlation here. So GTM predicted performance on the x-axis, real performance on the y. There's a co correlation of about 0.56, which is, you know, meaningful but not perfect. However, the most important thing to note is that things that the GTN predicts to be high performing are in fact high performing. We don't really care about missing these things over here because the goal of neural architecture search, at least our goal, is not to find every single high performing network. It's just to find a few high performing networks or one. And so all we really care about is that the thing the GTN draws our attention to and asks us to spend real ground truth evaluations on will actually end up, some of them will be high performing. And so if you take the top 10% of networks that the GTN said were good, we colored them here in blue, and then you look at their actual performance, they're all pretty good, and some of them are actually the best performing networks in this little sample here. And that's the property that you can harness. So another way to think about it is that if you look for the correlation between GTN predicted performance, and instead you were gonna use, you know, early stopping training, where you train for just a little bit of time and then you use that, resulting performance as a proxy for your ultimate performance, that the GTN gives you a better correlation with the true performance uh, in um, 128 steps as, you know, to get the same correlation as what GTN gives you in 128 steps, you'd need 1,200 steps on real data. So the GTNs in that sense are nine times faster than using real data. So if you look at the results, what you can see is that the GTNs are cool because they're kind of like a drop in replacement for real data. So you can take any method off the shelf, like this method here and the second to last line, this blue box, uh, and you, you know, it take it gives you a, a perplexity of, uh, or sorry, an error rate of two point five one. Lower is better, and but it took ten GPU days. But you drop in GPU data and you, sorry, GTN data, and you get slightly better performance but you do it in you know, two thirds of a day instead of 10 days. And you can look at any one of these pairs actually. And when you use real data, it takes about 10 days. When you use GTNs, you get better performance and it's way, way, way faster. So that's kind of what's so exciting uh, about this technique. And we could combine it with fancy, or you could combine it with fancier G, uh, NAS techniques as well, um, which is what's nice. It's kind of like a modular improvement to whatever method you like. Now, one final thing I want to point out is a little bit of a teaser is uh, I think GTN is really potentially promising for RL. And that's because in RL, uh, a huge challenge is discovering via exploration what, how, like, how do you so what is the problem that we're trying to solve and how do you solve it. Once you solve it, zapping that into a network is actually quite efficient and fast. So if you wanted to do architecture search and see how good a network is, at least at performing the task, not necessarily learning the task, then you could you know, rapidly kind of see, see how good these networks are. And so this plot here shows a normal RL on a very simple task, cold balancing in red. And then at the very, very end of training, that last blue data point is how well you can do with one step, one of, G, of training on GTN synthetic data. And the answer is that you can immediately zap the performance of that red curve into this network with one SGD step. And so therefore this is 100,000 times faster in terms of getting that performance into the network. Uh, and so there's a lot of promise, I think, here to kind of use this for architecture search or if you have to like get knowledge from one network into another network really fast, et cetera, using GTNs. And this is all super low-hanging fruit. No one on our team is kind of pushing on this anymore. So if anyone here is interested, um, you can go and explore this area. So to conclude the GTN portion of the talk, GTNs produce synthetic data that trans neural nets faster than real data, enabling rapid estimates of an architecture's performance. And you know, GTN combined with neural architecture search is competitive with state-of-the-art methods in NAS, yet via a very, very different method, which I think is really exciting because it gives us a new tool in our toolbox. Um, and it also could be combined with the other tools in the toolbox. So uh, what's kind of fun about this is this is architecture search via meta-learning. So that's meta-learning for meta-learning, which is a fun bonus. Combine all the buzzwords. Okay, so we've now done the GTN, and I wanted to show you another paper that uses meta-learning to produce synthetic data to accelerate neural architecture search, and that is the synthetic petri dish paper.
So here I want to once again celebrate mostly the same uh, co-authors, but I especially want to highlight Aditya, who's done a fantastic job leading the charge on this paper, as well as Ken Stanley, who had the original idea, uh, which I think is clever. So the motivation here is that, you know, as we all know, NAS is supercomputer intensive, and we're trying to speed it up. Now, previously we looked at methods that use training on real data for a short amount of time as an estimate of final performance at convergence. Another technique people use is to directly try to estimate what that final performance is going to be based on some sort of features or description of the network itself. So you like look at the architecture and you say, oh, that has no skip connections and only one layer that's going to perform terribly. Or you say that has a lot of layers and a lot of skip connections and like that or ResNet blocks. That's going to be very, very powerful and probably perform really well. So, um, you know, you can train a neural network to do that, any functional proxy network to kind of make that prediction. Now, usually people are doing this on a motif, like predicting how well like an RNN cell will do or a ResNet block, or sometimes on the entire network itself. The problem with this approach is that you have to generalize. You have to predict how well you're going to do in a new for a new architecture, something you've never seen before. And neural nets notoriously are bad at generalizing on distribution. So it's kind of hard to ask them to do this thing. But however, even if they are good, sometimes it's actually impossible to generalize. Uh, and so I want to, as a thought experiment, look at this picture on the right here. Imagine that you have samples only from the blue area. Further imagine that all bets are off within the red area. That you know, basically the data from the blue region is not predictive of what's going to happen in the red region. And you have no data in the red region. Well, no function approximator is going to do a good job at predicting what happens in the red region. Because by definition, something happens differently there. And so the question is, you know, can you do anything? And I want to suggest that we have an idea for how we could actually do well in generalizing even into areas that are different and that we have no data. And the idea is that we'll just use a component of the neural net itself in a simple, cheap experimental setting. That's idea number one. And then the second idea is that we will meta-learn which experiments are predictive of the performance we really care about. So, we'll, you know, which experiments will tell us what's going on uh, in this system. So uh, to motivate this, let's look at how real petri dishes work, you know, when scientists use them. So scientists will take, you know, if they're trying to study brain cells or they're trying to study coronavirus, they will take the real thing and they'll put it into a simplified setting. So imagine if you're trying to study how cells respond to the coronavirus or to a vaccine. You know, what we don't do is just take a function approximator, train them on past data, and then ask them to say, now what's going to happen with this coronavirus and like feed in the genome? At least we don't do that yet. We're not good enough. What we instead do is we take real cells, real live cells, we put them in a petri dish, out, so we take them out of the body, which is the complex world, we put them into a simplified study, which is a test tube or a petri dish, and then we infect them with coronavirus or with a vaccine, and then we study what happens. And so what happens, what, what, what's gone on there is we've taken a real thing, put it in a simplified setting, and then we've chosen experiments that will tell us, you know, what's, gonna ha what's happening in the setup. And that, we think, will inform us about what's happening out there in the real world. And because we have the real thing, you know, it's going to generalize better. Like, we, like cells might react entirely differently to a specific vac a new virus that we've never seen before. And so we wouldn't be able to predict that with a neural net, but we can predict it by watching what happens to those cells in the Petri dish. And we're going to do the same thing for neural architecture search. So here, we, in our setup here, we're going to be searching for motifs, either an activation function or like a res, uh, get a recurrent neural net cell, et cetera. And we want to find motifs that perform well in a large deep neural network on a hard problem. So we're going to call the really big network we care about the ground truth network and the, or the ground truth setting. Uh, and then we're also going to have this little tiny petri dish network, or otherwise we're going to call it a motif network. And in there, we're going to use the motif in question in a smaller setting, smaller simplified setting. So if we're searching for activation functions, we'll have we'll instantiate that little tiny network with those activation functions. And then we'll evaluate them in synthetic data whose job it is to tell us how well those, that, those motifs will perform when we put them into the bigger network. So uh, the way that we train the synthetic data is to match reality. So we start out, imagine that you have these five motifs. And um, when you put them in the real big network and you train them on the big problem you care about, this is their ordering, one through five. When we take those motifs and we put them in our little petri dish network and we evaluate them on our synthetic data, imagine that the, the ordering is initially all over the place. It's random. We'll use meta-learning to train synthetic data 
to prove such that when we train the, each of these little petri dish networks with SGD on the synthetic data, that the resulting performance is in the same rank order as what those motifs do out there in the real world. And that is the job of meta learning is to make that happen. Once that does happen, then we will, uh, we have the ability to take that petri dish, which is now predictive of performance in the real world and very, very fast because it's tiny. Uh, and we can search within it for new motifs that look like they perform really well. And then we can then test them out there in the real world, get that performance, bring it back, optimize the petri dish to you know to keep you know keep predicting what we're finding is true of the real world, and we can repeat this process to search for uh, new motifs really fast. I hope that makes sense. I know that's a bit of a brainful, but uh, if you're uh, confused, uh, you can ask the questions or look at the paper. So I want to give you a thought experiment about how this could discover something really powerful. So imagine if you were hoping that the system might discover convolution. Well, what would that look like? Imagine, for example, that your ground truth is such that, you know, motifs one and two are not performing very well, and three through five are. Now, you don't know it, but that three through five actually have convolution architectures. Uh, so the search space had convolution in it, and those got sampled, and they're performing really well. We don't really know why. Now, in the Petri dish, they're not performing in any sort of good order. You could hope that meta-learning would produce synthetic data that would tell you that, oh, actually, if you have whatever is in 3, 4, and 5, if you have that property, you perform really well. Now, what kind of synthetic data might tell you that? Well, any sort of synthetic data that tested for translation invariance. So I didn't tell you this yet, but the Petri dish can control the synthetic training set, but also produce a synthetic validation set optionally. And so imagine if you it automatically produce uh, training samples that look like this. So if in the training set, the network see these three examples, and they're supposed to call those stars. And then the validation set, we ask if it thinks this is a star. Well, the only architectures that will produce that result are architectures that have translation invariance. And so therefore, this training data tells you which networks are translation invariant or not, and therefore can predict which ones are performing better out there in the real world, because convolution does help you in the real world. And so and it's because of this property. So like science has been done by the system to tease apart this causal explanation for performance and then uh, a test for it and tell you if your thing happens. And then you, if you started searching in the search space, you probably would eventually only be searching for convolution architectures because those are the only ones that are going to perform well given this synthetic training data set. Now, I want to warn you, when you not ultimately fulfill this thought experiment in so far in this work, I think somebody should go do this. Whereas we were um, still testing in more simple settings, so we couldn't even see this show up. Okay, so the two main ideas in Petri dish are one, to use the neural net component itself in a simple and cheap experimental setting, and two, to meta learn which experiments are predictive. Uh, and so I'm saying that again, I've already said it, but I just think it's good to take a step back because it's kind of a complicated uh, system. Okay, so experiment one is going to try to show the benefits of this technique. So imagine if we're searching for the slope of a sigmoid. This is just like a test problem we designed to specifically show off the properties of the algorithm. So our goal is to predict the performance on MNIST of a neural net with two layers uh, that have 100 neurons per layer. So, you know, this is our big network for this toy uh, experiment. And, you know, they're going to have sigmoid activation functions in each of the neurons. Now, the, what's going to change the architecture search space here is just different slopes of the sigmoid. So this value C in this equation here, which determines the slope. So uh, consider this, this network here, and our goal is to find the optimal slope. There's the network. And here are the different possible, you know, what different values of C produce here. And... What you can do is, because this is a small enough problem, that's why we chose a, a somewhat simple or a small big network, we can just exhaustively go test all of these slopes and see their performance. And the performances you can see here in these blue dots. And so as you sweep across the sigmoid slope here in the x-axis, you see that there is this optimum around 0.23. And that's what we would want the architecture search system to find. Now, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to train. First, we're going to do the function approximate, a function approximator technique. We're going to try to predict performance as a function of C, but we're only going to train it on the data from this blue band here. So the network, the, the function approximator has to predict what is the best C given these points. Now, you can imagine what it's going to do. It's going to predict that the best C is somewhere up here toward the left because it's just going to fit a line to this very linear 
collecting data. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. So here you see the, the neural net, and it predicts that the optimal value is basically a slope of zero. Uh, and you know, how could it do any better? It's never seen anything that would tell it other than just like left is better. Now, let's look at the Petri dish approach. So here, in a real Petri dish, a neural scientist would go to the real big complex brain, take out a little piece of that brain, like a neuron, put it in a Petri dish, and subject it to some informative experiment. We're going to do the same thing. So our big brain is the full network, 100 neurons per layer, two-layer neural net with different sigmoid, with, uh, sigmoid activations. And we're going to produce this tiny little Petri dish network that has uh, only one neuron per layer instead of 200. And we're going to evaluate it on the synthetic data. And our synthetic data is tiny. It's just 40 samples of input size 10, as opposed to 60,000 samples of input uh, 784. So um, here is the architecture, the whole big complicated algorithm. We're going to take our ground truth network. We're going to take a few uh, to warm start it. We're going to do a few evaluations for some different sigmoids. And we're going to take out our little motif, which is to create this tiny little network. And then now we've got a few of these uh, different slopes. We're going to create synthetic data that makes the rank of these things indicative of how these things perform when we put them in the real big network. And then we're going to meta learn. Yeah, you know, we're going to meta learn for that to happen. And then we can kind of go through this process of. Uh, using the Petri dish once it's trained to search for new slopes. You can generate a whole bunch of candidate slopes and use the Petri dish to find the ones that you think are going to be the best and then go test those in the actual world, get that performance, bring it back, train your Petri dish, repeat the process, et cetera. And the result you can see here in green. So the Petri dish is now predicted that these are the results of what these slopes are going to look like. And the most important thing to note is, well, actually, first of all, I'll note that the, the optimum by the Petri dish is here, you know, uh, which is not too far from the optimal point of 0.23. So it was pretty close. But much more important than that is look what happens to the left. Look how well this thing generalizes. It's not perfectly matching the exact performance of like slopes, uh, sigmoid slopes for very low values of like, you know, 0, 0 0.1, et cetera. But it has the general qualitative fact that performance falls off pretty steeply, and so you don't want to keep in, uh, decreasing the slope all the way down to zero. It basically did the magic of generalizing really well, completely outside of its training data, in a way that is representative of reality, and that's because it has a tiny piece of reality, its reality, which is neural nets trained with SGD, with, active, with sigmoid functions of various slopes, it has a tiny piece of that reality inside it. So in some sense, you could say it's cheating. But it's cheating in exactly the right way that engineers and scientists should be cheating, which is getting huge speed ups and huge gains via, um, you know, kind of using some insights about how we might be able to do that and general, and, you know, to generalize better. So this is the kind of cheating I think we want to be doing. So um, the main experiment now, I'm going to switch away from the simple sigmoid slope experiment to the main experiment. We wanted a more challenging search space and a more um, uh, harder problem. So now we're going to be searching for recurrent neural network cells, and we're going to be doing this on Penn Tree Bank. So the search space is from prior work. You can see the sites here. Uh, this is a large search space with very few good solutions, and we're searching for a recurrent neural network cell that is reused at each time step. Uh, as you chunk through a whole bunch of this data. So here it is here. The idea is that there are these 12 blocks, and we have to figure out, first of all, what activation function should be used in each one of these neural layers. Uh, and there's four options that you can see there. And then the second thing is we have to figure out what is the wiring diagram amongst these 12 layers to ultimately go from you know, the inputs, which are up here, to the output, which is down here. And so this this network in total has 27 million parameters, so it's a pretty big network, and it's trained on a really big data set, uh, and so it's very expensive. So to do, you know, each ground truth evaluation takes about 10 hours on a GPU, uh, as you can see here. So that's pretty expensive. So the Petri this year, we're going to reduce the width, we're going to take the exact same network, this fat thing here, we're just going to make it skinny. So each one of those modules we're going to take from 800 wide, like 800 neurons down to 3 neurons, Otherwise, the network is exactly the same. So we go from 27 million parameters to 140 parameters. We're also going to dramatically reduce the data set size from a million word down to 2,000 words for our little uh, synthetic Petri dish. 
So normal architecture, uh, you generate a bunch of networks, you'd evaluate them, and then you'd use that to generate new networks. Here you can just stick Petri dish in the middle and you can use, you can have the neural network uh, generate, the thing that's like, you know, producing new candidate architectures, but this is supposed to evaluating everything it suggests, you can generate a lot of those like M, use the Petri dish to then filter M down to the, the very, very few, which are K, that you think are really, really good, like worth spending your ground truth evaluation budget on, evaluate just those, and then repeat the process. So um, the Petri dish itself adds neg negligible computational cost, just two hours on like a MacBook CPU, which you know pales in comparison to the vast amount of GPU compute you need to train out these ground truth evaluations. So for our control, we have a random search with partial evaluation. So you train a little bit and you use the final thing as a proxy. We also use NAO, which is a state-of-the-art technique. I don't have time to get into it right now, but basically it parses the network. Uh, it kind of reads the network, if you will. It encodes that into a latent uh, space. It can then predict performance as a function of the latent space, and then it decodes from the latent space back to the network. That allows you to take gradient steps in the latent space to improve performance. And then once you have a candidate latent vector that you think is going to be high performing, you can decode it, get the final architecture, and run it. Now, um, the original Now paper had 1,000 ground truth evals, which was very expensive. That's 300 GPU days. We wanted to level up the playing field, and we're focused on the low compute regime. So we have all treatments to use less than 100 ground truth evals. So first we did, this is random search with partial evaluation. You can see as you give it more uh, you know, samples, it does better, but the slope is not great. If you add in NAO with reduced data, so the NAO technique, uh, but just with the 100 ground truth evals, this is your slope, which is better. But then if you add in Petri dish, what you can see is that it actually, this is Petri dish with random search. It is kind of a big improvement over random search without the Petri dish. So it's doing a big improvement in terms of kind of not only spending the, the ground truth budget on good samples. And then if you take NAO and you just use the Petri dish in addition to it, you do even better. Uh, and that's the blue curve here. So one way to think about this is compare green to black, uh, and you get a lift there when you switch to Petri dish, or when you use Petri dish data instead of real data, you go from red to blue, and you get a, a, a step up in terms of NAO. So once again, like GTNs, this is like a technique that you can kind of just drop in and improve other methods which is pretty cool. If you are interested in comparing our work to the original NAO result, you know, uh, the original NAO got a perplexity of 56 and lower is better. Uh, synthetic Petri dish NAO got 57.1, which is, you know, roughly comparable, uh, but with one tenth of the compute. So that's a nice trade off to have in your arsenal. So to conclude this part of the talk, um, you know, Petri dishes kind of embody science that we're going to like, we're going to say reality, or at least a piece of reality, is the best prior. We can't generalize very well if we just try to function approximate from past data. So you take a piece of the real thing and you experiment on that because that will tell you a lot about how the reality that you're working with works. And you can apply that idea to neural architecture search as we have seen. We saw that on the sigmoid slope experiment very kind of intuitively and dramatically. And then we saw the performance gains of doing it on a harder real world language modeling task. I didn't say it, but by the way, the task there was to predict the next word given the previous words. So kind of your standard language modeling task. So future work here, uh, there's lots of possibilities. I encourage people to play with this nice sandbox. You can you know, mix the Petri dish into many other NAS methods. You could either swap it in instead of the predictor that they're using, or I think it's even more interesting to use them both. You, know? uh, you can mix and match these two predictors. You could do a weighted combination of them. You could use them as a double filter, et cetera, to you know, really kind of figure out where you should spend your ground truth evaluations. I also think somebody should go do that compilational example I said. I think it'd be great to see that actually show up. Uh, it would prove the intuition behind this method. And I also think it's kind of at the highest level, like where else can this insight apply that we can take a piece of reality and use it when making machine learning predictions? I encourage you to kind of see where you can apply that concept. So my overall conclusions for the whole talk, uh, I think that it is reasonable to question whether the dominant paradigm in machine learning is right. Is the manual path that we are mostly committed to as a community the right path and the fastest path? Or should we recognize the trend within our own field that we have brought about, which is that as more compute and more data becomes available, 
end-to-end learn solution and machine learn solutions replace hand design solutions. So let's apply that to machine learning itself and start trying to automate and learn as much of the machine learning pipeline as possible. That is a push towards AI generating algorithms or algorithms that you start them up and as they train, 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 eventually they produce really powerful uh, AI. It's an all in bet on meta learning and you've seen a lot of that in this talk. So to make progress on that, we need to make progress on three pillars, meta learning the architectures, algorithms, and automatically generating the environments. And in this talk, I focused on that first pillar, which is two different projects that use meta learning to synthetically generate data that can catalyze or accelerate pillar one, which is meta learning uh, the architectures themselves. So I think these projects are demonstrate there's a lot of exotic, weird, fun, new methods that we can play with uh, on NAS in particular, and also in the general paradigm of AI generating algorithms and really trying to push ourselves as rapidly as possible to achieve the grandest ambitions of our field as set out by Turing. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks for this great talk on this very exciting topic. I think we can now kick off the Q&A phase. Um, any questions here? Yes, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, talk. Um, going back to the uh, original uh, or the first uh, topic on uh, synthet generating synthetic data for uh, meta learning architectures. Uh, can you give a little bit more intuition why such uh, generated images uh, improve performance? Because uh, as you said, they don't look like the, the, the real images. Uh, so what is there? Can you give a little bit more intuition why and how that improves then the performance so much? Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to make sure the audio is working, but I think I hear myself echoing back. Can somebody let me know that you can hear me? Okay, good. All right. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to indulge and I'm going to um, share my screen. Is that possible? Will people, yeah, will people be able to see this? Um, you would have somebody would have to. That's I think that somebody might have to enable me to share it. Uh, oh no, it's working. Here we go. All right. So, um, in anticipation of that question, I actually um, have just two slides I want to share. So. Uh, you know, it's it's a I'm answering a related question, but it's one that I think will help shed light on the question you asked, which is kind of like, why are these images alien? Uh, why might that be the case? And can you probe that scientifically? So we spent a lot of time. Sorry, my headphones like to mute themselves. We spent a lot of time thinking about why these images might look so alien. And in front of you, I don't know if you can share my screen, hopefully, or see my screen. Hopefully you can. Yep. Um, but there are three hypotheses. One is that um realism helps like it would be better for optimization for performance if the images looked more real and we're just not being very good at optimization uh you know and therefore um whoa that's probably not as good and so it, we're failing to um to get there so you know that's just kind of a simple uh, explanation the other hypothesis which i think is also interesting is that realism actually might be bad. And so the fact that they are unrealistic is because we're doing a good job of optimization and the network is figuring out a better strategy than, you know, real images. Now, why might that be the case? So one thing that you could imagine is that you have very few samples to train your network, right? So the whole goal is to try to train somebody as fast as possible. So if I show you one seven and then a second seven, uh, maybe that's inefficient. Maybe I could kind of show you 10 different se uh, sevens somehow compressed down into one image where you learn the key features in different part of the images, all these different things about sevens all at once with one image, or maybe make it a hundred or a thousand different sevens are kind of compressed together. If you were going to do that, then the resulting thing probably doesn't look like a seven, but it might make the neurons, the parameters in your network better at recognizing different weird sevens, you know, just with that one shot. Uh, a second a hypothesis for why non-realism might actually be useful is basically that it's doing domain randomization. If it showed you canonical seven, canonical seven, canonical seven, and then out there in the real world, it sees seven with a little bit of noise or some, uh, you know, an accident of the writing or something like that, then it wouldn't be good at generalizing to the seven. As we know, if you train on just really, really pure idealized data and then you deal with the noisy world, you're not going to do as well. So maybe basically it's like saying, here's the seven and here's a whole bunch of random background noise that you should learn to ignore 
because the real thing you want to focus on is the signal and not the noise. And then to do that, it has to show it some noise. Um, so I think those are kind of some interesting reasons why realism might might hurt. And then uh, the third kind of camp is maybe that it just doesn't matter at all. Like you can learn based on realistic images, based on kind of weird looking alien images. Like this kind of reminds me of the deep neural nets are easily fooled paper. There's all sorts of images that will get the weights to where they need to be to do the job. They just don't look to us like sevens, but sevens would be equally as good, real sevens. Um, and just in the vast space of all images, there are more of these kind of weird, unrealistic things that do the job versus the realistic things that do the job. So optimization tends to find amongst arbitrarily equally stuff, the unrealistic ones. Now, one of the other thing I want to share, which is why I was sharing my slides, um, they got really small, um, but I want to share this here, which is that there are three hypotheses um, that come out of these camps. And they're not necessarily like going to shed any light on which of these camps is right, but I thought it was pretty interesting. And it was that, um, you know, compression may combine key features together. Like, oh, I want to put a whole bunch of the key parts of a seven into one image. Or it might be the case that, you know, it wants to teach you what the top left of a seven looks like in one type of seven and the bottom right of a seven from a different type of seven. They don't have to be in the same image. So they kind of get all cut, cut, cut up across the network. Or if it's doing domain randomization, there should be the signal of the, of the real sevens in there, and then the rest is noise. All three of those hypotheses would predict that if you just average all of the synthetic images together, you should get back to canonical digits. And then what you see below, I don't know if it's big enough for you to see because of the weird thing that happened when I I'm tried to go into presentation mode. But you're, basically, you're still showing ghostly the realism. first slide. Oh, it's not uh, showing okay. figured. Yeah, so let me um, let's try to fix that real fast. Because uh, it's cool to see the results. So I will share again. And I will go here, share. And it's still in presentation yep. mode. Oh, you can see it now? Yes. Okay. And can you see these ghostly images in the bottom? Nope. Just no. the <clears throat> three tools on the right. Top right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's try one more time. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. This is the technical detail that would have happened even if I was there live. So uh, bear with me. And let's try one last time. And if not, I'll just tell you what happens verbally. All right. How about that? Perfect. We see good. Okay. Now we see ghost images. So here are the average of all the synthetic images. So this is cool, right? Like each one looks totally weird and alien, but on average, clearly, it's giving you back the digits. So it doesn't really tell us which camp is right. I think it's, it would be fun for somebody to do more science to try to figure it out. I actually think it's fun just that all these possibilities are out there. We don't know what their answer is. So there's some fun uh, um, science if somebody wants to look into that more. Sorry, that was a very long answer to your question, but it's like one of my favorite questions about this paper. So I took some time to enjoy answering it long in long form. Good. Yeah, another hypothesis there could actually be data augmentation, right? We, we do data augmentation in training networks and uh, it, it's doing some crazy um, changes of your data in order to train well. So. Sorry, yeah, that's actually what I mean by domain randomization. I'm using the RL yeah, term right. for it, um, but yeah, same thing. Yeah, you're just kind of adding some right. noise, you're translating, you're cropping it, you know, et cetera. All right, cool. Um, yeah, uh, thank you also uh, for the talk from my side. I, I, super thought provoking. And I thought about one thing that I think could be actually really, um, really important for the NAS community. So there, there's over a thousand papers in neural architecture search in the last two years. And um, not all of it is, is, is guided towards the right direction. And so in order to do that, we've been developing a lot of NAS benchmarks. Now, um, these NAS benchmarks are, are great, but they have lots of limitations and they can particularly well be used for um, black box optimization and so on, but, but not so much for one-shot models. Now with a Petri dish, you could actually come up with a surrogate benchmark that supports any type of NAS algorithm while still looking like a real NAS problem. You could actually put in arbitrary search spaces. There, there's a lot of cool things there. So I, I think I totally want to work on that. So I, I encourage anyone in the audience after this uh, to just come up and, and chat whether someone wants to do something. Jeff, let's talk. Um, I think this is awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's actually that's a fantastic direction to push on. I also mentioned as a plug to the audience that Frank has taken up the gauntlet on trying the, the RL um, uh, uh, synthetically generating data, the GTNs for RL stuff, and has some work that maybe uh, at some point he could summarize and share on that. So 
Um, that's also very exciting. I still, I think I still think there's more to be done. So I threw it out there as a challenge because I didn't want to turn people off to that. But if you are interested in that, then I suggest you take out the workout of Frank's group. Let's uh, look into that. Thanks. I hope you can from here. Um, also related to this, um, to what extent is this related to, for instance, self-supervised learning? Uh, are these GTNs actually like learning embeddings or learning good features? Um, and also, if if this is somehow uh, um, learning auxiliary tasks that might be related to what you said earlier about humans learning basketball not by playing games but by like playing with all kinds of auxiliary tasks, getting better at it. And so I was just wondering what the relationship was between this and self-supervised learning. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I would say that I see the particular works that I presented in this talk today as different than self-supervised learning in the sense that they're not going and consuming ahead of time uh, some massive data set that was gathered for other reasons trying to extract information and signal from it, and then maybe being fine-tuned to a particular task. Here, this is truly like an end-to-end -end system where everything that is learned is being driven ultimately by the final performance that it's getting out of the real world. And it's not being given a whole lot of, um, of extra information ahead of time that kind of can see it. But the one thing that I do want to mention, which I think is really interesting, is a lot of times, you know, to the overall topic of the talk, which is AIGAs, a lot of people say like, okay, this sounds pretty cool and it would be great if we could do it. But that is a very expensive proposition to learn, you know, as much of AGI or all of AGI kind of in an end-to-end -end fashion with a lot of like an expensive auto loop, et cetera. You know, Josh Tenenbaum once phrased this as, you know, how are you going to do this without a planet-sized computer? Because which is what Darwin, you know, Darwinian evolution took to solve this problem. Uh, fair point. And so I think that the, the challenge for us is kind of like, can we look out and try to figure out how to speed this up? Like, can we look for ways to make this orders of magnitude more efficient? You know, and one candidate for that are like better abstractions um, for uh, that, that will make things more efficient. For example, when you generate environments, what's the right search base, et cetera. Um, but the second thing that I think is hugely important, and especially it's been proven true in the last you know handful of years, is that basically AIGAs can move fast by standing on giant human, on standing on the shoulders of giant human data sets. And in general, I actually think that the, the push toward AGI will be catalyzed dramatically by standing on the shoulders of giant human data sets. We've seen that in almost every modality, GPT uh, for text, you know, we've seen that for pre-training for images. You know, recently we, out of OpenAI, we put out this work on video pre-training, which does the same thing for kind of RL domains like Minecraft. And so I think that is an example where basically we don't have to bootstrap from the level of like the first replicators and bacteria all the way through to human level AI, because we have this giant leapfrog, which is we consume all the data from the internet that gets things started, but then you can still launch uh, in a process with, you know, open-endedness, it's automatically generating problems and, and, and solving them, that's searching through the space of architectures. So how might that work for some of these things? Well, one thing you could imagine is you consume knowledge of every architecture ever generated uh, that can see the system that then is making candidate proposals that are really intelligent as opposed to kind of random permutations like we're seeing in a lot of neural architecture searches are very intelligent permutations and suggestions uh, based on past information. Uh, and similarly over in like the, the pillar three, automatically uh, trying to create an open-ended process where an agent is like generating challenges and then solving them. Well, you know, you go to Minecraft, go to Minecraft, for example, watch all of the videos of Minecraft, read the entire internet's discussion of Minecraft. Now you can generate candidate challenges. You've got good priors to go out and solve them. You have very sample efficient learners. They're basically doing like humans do, human children, like making up their own challenges and then going and solving them, getting bored with that and moving on to the next thing. So again, that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but I see a huge space and an opportunity for self-supervised learning, but we in these particular projects haven't yet uh, added that in. Thanks for the talk. Um, I would like to also highlight that this direction is very interesting because it's good for the environment. It requires less resources to train. Um, I was wondering how important, uh, like the, the way how uh, we learn the representation on synthetic data, because I guess it is important to learn the causal features. Um, could you elaborate on, on, on that? Um, on representation learning, someone mentioned about self-supervised, could be learned different way, but, uh, and, and 
no matter how, how much data we have, sometimes if, if we don't be able to learn these causal features, maybe it is not that good. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think it's a fascinating point. So um, your question caused me to think of a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts. Uh, I'll just mention, mention a few of them. One of them is that I really do like the fact that the Petri dish has this magical, seemingly magical um, capability to lock onto causal features that will generalize in a way that a function approximator or like a vanilla neural net never, ever could. And my favorite example is that convolutional example, where it basically learns in the Petri dish that, hey, if I have if I have a shape in three quadrants and I never see it in the fourth quadrant in the training set, what I want to do is in the validation set, I want to measure whether or not it's generalizing to that fourth quadrant. And therefore, if it is, then it's translation invariant. That's a useful thing. And that's probably a very predictable success in the real world. And you could imagine that that's just one example of like how many different features and things like that would it learn? Uh, automatically. In fact, it might even be interesting to let it rip at scale, do a really good job, get to a really good Petri dish, and then go in and try to figure out like, okay, what actually has it learned about, you know, what is predictive of good networks? Um, the things that we, there are maybe principles that we don't even realize yet that it would discover that are very, very helpful. Uh, so I think that's, that's really fun. And that's really interesting. Another thing I want to mention is that you talked about like, what are the features that are being learned? You know, if you go back to like uh, the GTN paper, for example, it's the generator that is learning um, the features that are really essential in terms of the features of like what type of data it needs to generate in order to um, spit out for the learner to, to learn off those features and then go do well in the real world. And so that's the network that you're really worried about. Like, does it have itself, does it have the right architecture and is it going to learn the right features? Is it, have, is it big enough? Um, has it seen enough data? And so it kind of pushes that feature learning question back, you know, and that learning to that extra network. Um, and so I basically agree with you that it, it you know, basically, I, it, the cool thing here is that it's a lot, it's end-to-end -end training. And so with the right setup, it should learn the right features on its own, as long as it doesn't have some constraint that's preventing that from happening, uh, which is very exciting. And then you could go study them, the features that they're learning. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take one more question from the chat from Shankar Kumar. Um, is there a metric that tells us whether the Petri dish is a good proxy for the real network? If so, have you taken such a metric into account for the overall method? Yeah, so um, basically, yes, there's a metric. You can just go see whether or not the, the synthetic, the Petri dish is ranking the motifs in the same order, uh, ranking the small versions of the networks in the same way that you uh, see in the real world, which is when you take those motifs, you put them in a the large network, you scale them up and you train. The challenge there is that we, the in, in when we're, you know, in the in the toy domains, we can exhaustively study this. Um, in the big domains, and the ground truth evaluations are very expensive, and so we ourselves didn't have the ability to do enough that you could really get a sense of like how well is it predicting like across like a huge swath of the search space. Um, so we didn't push on that ourselves, but as Frank mentioned. Uh, and Frank has been a pioneer of, there are all these awesome benchmarks out there of pre-trained networks uh, where you have a lot of the ground truth evaluations already ahead of time and you don't have to um, uh, spend any more carbon to produce them and they're, they're there for you. So we didn't do it because you know we uh, were focused on the science that you saw presented today, but it would be really cool to try these methods in those domains where you have a lot of that, those evaluations and then kind of study the question you're asking more directly. All right. Um, then let's uh, thank our speaker again. A round of applause. And thank you once again to the organizers. Thank you, Jeff, for fantastic. your time also and for the great talk. Okay. Thank you all.